The Unlikely Innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel. Presented by Cambrian R&D and the Center for Smart Mining. Mike, at the risk of pissing off all of our previous guests, this was one of my favorite episodes so far. Uh, definitely my favorite episode so far um, with regard to the talk of craft brewing. Um, this week we had Kristen Cianfrani on, who is the president of uh, CADSI. And I had a, just a great time. I don't know how you felt. Yeah, no, it was it was great. And I think in in full disclosure, you know, Pat and I were at CANSEC and we talked about this in the episode. And CANSEC is the like premier event of, of CADSI every year. It's uh, for those of you who have been to PDAC, think of PDAC, but obviously for the defense and securities industries. And I remember I remember actually not knowing at the time who, who Kristen was, but now that I've you know had the chance to meet her and, and we did our homework on her, it was her that we saw on the show floor. And what I remember saying to Pat was, there, there goes an important person because she didn't have, <laughs> she didn't have a tag on. So yeah, like, yeah, obviously yeah. at these conferences, everybody has badges. Like you can't go anywhere without your badge. You can't go into the conference without your badge, but she had no, no badges on at all. And so if you're I, walking around without a badge at a yeah. defense conference, you got something going on. Yeah. And of course she does because she's the president CEO of CADSI, which puts on CANSEC every year. So again, yeah. that, that, uh, that one quick glimpse we had her at the conference to now chatting with her here today. It was great. Again, I think we really appreciate her insights on, you know, her career path and, you know, you know, what she's been able to do with CADSI since, you know, taking the, the president, uh, the president's role in 2014. Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly we did have a lot of fun at the end talking about craft beer. I know that I have to go back to the episode oh, and yeah. listen over and write some notes because some of those re resonate with me, but there's others that I think I have to try now. So, well, I think like, and she provided tasting notes on some of them. So I think this is uh, a, <laughs> Some people might be coming because she's the president of the Canadian Association of Defense and Securities Industries, but you're going to stay for the culinary and brewing talk at the end. So um, I think we'll get quickly out of the way. It was a lot of fun. You could tell Mike and I were having a lot of fun. And uh, we now bring you uh, Kristen Cianfrani. We're back now and we're pleased to be joined by Kristen Cianfrani, uh, president and CEO of, of CASDI, which is the Canadian Association of Defense and Securities Industries where her role is to lead an organization that represents the business interests of over 650 member companies across Canada. She is responsible for creating an environment that showcases CADSI's members in the domestic and international marketplaces and with government stakeholders at home and abroad. She holds a master's degree from the University of Toronto and a bachelor's degree from Royal Military College of Canada. Her time at RMC included a stint as a maritime surface and subsurface uh, Mars officer with the Royal Canadian Navy. The next stage of her career uh, brought her to Canada's aerospace, defense, and securities industries, where for over two decades, uh, Kristen has blazed a trail for women in the sector. After starting as a project specialist at CAE Inc., she rose through the ranks, eventually holding leadership positions in strategy, R&D, and business solutions. In 2014, she became the first woman to lead CASDI. At that time, perceptions of the defense industry as being solely focused on weapons manufacturing prevailed and the sector was grappling with procurement related issues as Canada's armed forces looked to purchase hundreds of billions of dollars of equipment. Uh, Kristen saw huge potential and with the help of her team has spent the past seven years modernizing the association. I guess it should be eight years now because we're in 2022, but that's okay. Strengthening ties with government and growing CADSI's signature event, CANSEC, uh, which we'll talk about. It was, I got to go this year for the first time. Uh, oh. So CADSI is now considered the preeminent association representing the defense, security and cyber sectors in Canada. And I will cut off the bio there. So welcome to the show, Kristen. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. That is so obnoxious. <laughs> <Those> <laughs> it's like the most awkward thing ever, right? Uh, it's, it's No, yeah. it's, it's great. I think it speaks to the accomplishments and the career you've had. And I mean, we want to talk about that with you today. So maybe what I'll do is we always like to talk to our guests before we get into what you're currently doing as, as president and CEO of, of CADSI. But uh, I guess going back to what initially drew you to RMC, was that always where you thought you would go to school? Maybe talk a little bit about your path and, and what, what led you to uh, Royal Military College of Canada. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's no magic here. I, I, so I grew up in Leamington, Ontario, right? Tomato capital of Canada. Um, and uh, my family, so it was given that I wouldn't, I, you know, there's no university there. I, I wasn't, I, University of Windsor was probably too close to home for me. And so, uh, you know, my family lived, we were really modest. Uh, we didn't, you know, stuff was, you know, tight at home and, and going away to university um, would have been a challenge for my parents uh, financially and, and uh, 
for me, it probably put me in debt for the you know rest of good portion of my life. So I thought, hey, um, why don't I go and do this thing that you can do and get you know my university paid for for five in, in exchange for about five years of service, and um, that it would guarantee me a job following university. Um, but and and there was interestingly enough, there was a push on at the at the time uh, to increase the number of women in in uniform in the in the armed forces and. There are all these amazing ads that showed, you know, being a naval diver and like drug interdictions, you know, Zodiacs uh, pulling up to all these big, these drug pirates and whatever, um, all underpinned by this, you know, heart pounding music. Uh, and like, little did I know that that was not what I was headed into uh, at all when I graduated, uh, because the, the, the CAF, the Canadian Armed Forces at the time, was going through what we call uh, in defense a decade of darkness. You may have heard that phrase used, um, where you know budgets were slashed, operations and and bases were closed down, and essentially they went through a big layoff. And mm -hmm. and I and I got out at that time. So, you know, that's the background. That's how I got there. Um, my dad, Italian immigrant, uh, always probably messaged us from an early age about. Um, you know, be proud to be a Canadian. He came over when he was 15. So, you know, you've got a lot of privileges uh, growing up in this country. And I, and I think that's a bit in my wiring too. So it's not surprising that I chose the, that, that option for school and, and that career path that I followed after that. Uh, I really want to ask you about Leamington a bit later uh, because I spent a week there a couple of weeks ago, actually. Uh, oh my God, really? It has changed so much. Yes, oh, really? Eh? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I had a uh, a really good meal at a place called Freddy's. I don't know if that resonates with you. Right on the water. Um, I forget the name. Why bring it up if I can't remember the name of the street on it? But uh, anyway, I'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. But um, you're not the first sort of military person we've had on. Uh, a while back, Mike and I spoke to Captain Dale Dye, who is most known for his roles on Band of Brothers and his work as a military consultant on film. And um, he sort of talked about how his journey uh, started when he wanted, or his real journey in, in, the, in the Hollywood business was he wanted to challenge perceptions of military service and war depictions in Hollywood. And I think what we wanted to do is sort of draw a line between that and sort of your experience with the sector. Um, has your experience in this sector led you to challenge any sort of misconceptions in the industry about Canada and Canadian and the Canadian military from your perspective? Oh my God. Like, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, obvious one, but, uh, but yeah. So um, second half of my career, I spent nearly 20 years working for a company uh, CAE. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know them, uh, kind of famous worldwide for their simulators, flight simulators, uh, um, and that company prides itself on, you know, creating things that save people's lives, right? Uh, whether that's uh, pilots or, or, or patients, or like in the case of COVID, they made ventilators, the general public. Um, so, you know, the, in, their, in their heads and in my head too, uh, depictions of war or, or the industry or the things that we do are, are about, oddly enough, saving people. Right, uh, keeping people safe, and and so that leads me to you know view it always through the lens of maybe deterrence as opposed to actually uh, front uh, front end front facing stuff. So um, so that's one thing. And then and then you know if I showed you the average you know headline or picture that accompanies something like Cansec, uh, our trade show, or um, the military when they're using our equipment. Uh, you know, you'd think we were all about the pointy end of the stick, right? Which is, which is like 5% of what we do in, in Canada. It's really, really marginally small. And, you know, the vast majority of the stuff we do are like equipment and services that we call um, dual use, which basically means that, you know, there's a commercial uh, offshoot to almost to most of the things that we make. Um, so you could find, you know, some of these things in your own backyard. A good example uh, would be, you know, CAE makes simulators for Chinook helicopters for the Canadian Armed Forces. And they make uh, the simulators for the 787 that's uh, your pilot is sitting in with Air Canada, right? And, and that's what we kind of do in Canada because the sector is so small that you need to make sure that you have something else to kind of bread your butter, right? So, um, so there's that. And, and, and there's, there's, 
cool stuff, right? Like um, <laughs> I use that loosely, but like just cool stuff, like uh, robots that look at ships' hulls and and uh, and uh, satellites. Uh, I know. I, I think Mike, you're a big fan of space, or maybe it's you, Steve. But uh, both. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're space nerds, so so you know we uh, we do the the low Earth alt- uh, orbit satellites and and radar sat, which looks at uh, kind of like climate change right now and an environmental things. So. So, you know, uh, uh, that's really sort of the thing is that there's, there's this iconography that represents our sector, which I think is nothing like like what it is. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you guys were at Kansas, right? Uh, or at least Mike, you were at Kansas. Yeah, Mike and, was, uh, yeah. yeah, Mike. So going into it for your first time, which is perfect because you, you knew nothing about it, probably. Um, so going into it, what did you expect to see, right? And, and then what did you see and were like, did you get challenged your own notions of what you're going to see when you when you went there? Well, that's you've actually set me up for the for one of the questions I wanted to ask you is because I, I think know I'm interviewing you. Now. This is your podcast <laughs> now. This so. is a first. This is a first, Mike. <laughs> Flip the script. I like it. No, but I I, I agree because that was what I was going to ask you is that going into the conference, like I had a sense that I you know I thought I was going to see a lot of cool tech you know from a variety of applications, whether it's cyber or defense or deterrence. So like I was kind of, I think, going into a pretty neutral, but, you know, we had heard from some of our other colleagues or other folks we have in our orbit around here that, you know, why are you guys going to that? Like, that's a that's a military conference. It's the weapons conference. Like, what are we going to get out of this? Like, why would Cambrian attend something like this? And, you know, part of what I was grappling with when I was hearing that was I said, well, we're in Sudbury where we pull a lot of nickel out of the ground and these metals go into some of the munitions and things that you are opposed. So where do we draw the line? Is it, do you draw the line at, at the defense and securities industries, or do you draw the line at the companies that are pulling the critical minerals out of the ground that go into the things that we need to protect and, you know, serve our country. So I think I went into it pretty open-minded and what I, what I came away from was that it's not at all, I think what a lot of people think about it, but from your perspective over the last you know seven years in your role at, at CADSI, has has the perception of the conference changed at all? Or do you still find that we're still grappling with the with the preconceived notions that it's it's a it's a you know it's a weapons conference and that uh, you have protesters out, outside the gates every year? Well, I mean, if you're in the sector, I think uh, that it doesn't surprise you, right? Like if you're, you know, if you're one of the companies in the sector or you're D and D, or even if you're academia that participates with us a lot, you're, you're probably not surprised by, by CANSEC, although it has had a, a, a major transformation. So we spent the last seven years really, really pulling in that cyber piece, pulling in emerging tech. Uh, it would have been a lot more conventional uh, when I started and, and, you know, I think that's the brainchild of, of, of all the, the, the kids that work with me, uh, which is, you know, they, they kind of, I said, look, there are a lot of weird perceptions around offense. And they said, yeah, and we just kind of made it different, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, and the industry itself is getting shaped differently, right? So, so you always will probably hear uh, people say, you know, that war is, the conflicts are very different. Um, peace, keeping peace. Uh, we don't even use that term anymore. We use peace operations. It's very different from the way it used to be. So the sector itself is evolving and the show has evolved, I think, along with it quite, quite nicely. Um, but, you know, around the protesters, like absolutely every, every single year, you know, we, we've got uh, protesters uh, sort of the, the cool thing about it, or I guess not cool, cool thing about it, but the interesting thing about it, I suppose, is, um, is that, you know, like, um, we're lucky that we live in this country where you can uh, a protest a show like that. You have, you have that freedom to do that. You know, I mean, heck, uh, you can apparently get, you know, a, a hot tub and a, a bouncy castle and occupy Ottawa for a month, right? Like, uh, and, and, and so we see that. Um, and, and it's not it's not you know surprising uh that 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 is the perception that that uh those people not in the sector have um but you know and and probably to some extent the average person as well uh you know off the street your colleagues for example would have sort of the same uh maybe thoughts uh, about about the sector um maybe because we don't feel threatened in Canada, not really uh, in our daily life, right? Um, we sort of miss the nuance as Canadians, how the de- have defense, uh, what we call defense actually fits into our lives every day and how uh, it keeps us 
connected in terms of the rest of the world and the language that our, our allies or other countries countries speak. So, you know, a real simple example. Um, you've got fires, there's there's fires out in, in British Columbia right now, right? Uh, the average Canadian, I don't believe, would make a connection between uh, the um, the water bombers Mm -hmm. uh or the what we call the bambi buckets those are those orange buckets that are slung loads on on helicopters right they wouldn't make the connection between those things and um that the defense sector it's the defense sector that makes those things right and and so so you have to kind of it's very nuanced that that kind of stuff um and while we make the the standard military kit that you everyone has you know come to know and love and see um there's just so much more right mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence and quantum computing, cloud technologies, all of those same companies that do that are, are members of ours, right? Um, it's all under our umbrella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, it's interesting. We, we also asked uh, Chris Hadfield when he was on, we had the the, the pleasure of, of interviewing him and we are Steve, space Steve's nerds. Name, Steve's name dropping today, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, he must have been like, I would have been super stoked. Yeah. Well, so but I, I, by the way, she's a super space nerd. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we were, uh, you know, like I'm a Star Trek nerd. I don't want to say it too loud, although this is going out to our listeners. So <laughs> yeah, we'll hear it anyways. The world. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, we had, we had a, a moment where, you know, so you think about, innovations in the Canadian sort of space industry uh, and you know immediately a Canadian could think of the Canadarm but then after that you know the list gets thin and, and even my mind are there any sort of uh, touchstone companies or innovations within your sector that you know we could proudly say is like a Canadian invention that is used the world over I, I mean I think of the tech that's gone into stretching the life of the CF-18 and things like that but bingo oh oh cool yeah, well, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I mean, like, hey, uh, how about you do my part? <laughs> already reverse the role, so you can just give the answer. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, space. Uh, so MDA, they make the Canada arm, very famous on our five dollar bill. Um, they also, you know, do the radar sat constellation, uh, and they're doing the lunar gateway, right? Um, so, so th those are some other things that are that are done by them. Not to mention. Um, in that same family uh we're undergoing right now we're building um some low earth orbiting uh satellites right uh, uh so that's going to come online and that that is also uh being done by companies within within the sector um things that you might know of uh, i mean you hit it on the head we don't make a lot of platforms in canada we don't so the the air plane that you see or the fighter jet that you see we don't we don't make those things our competencies actually in the parts and components. So the engines, uh, the sensors, uh, and then we do the systems integration of, of those uh, very, very well of those extra special things and, um, and the maintenance repair and overhaul, right? Which is the exact reason why those CF-18s were, were you're flying well beyond their best before date uh, because, because Hey, you got Canadians out there, you know, uh, with the uh, with the special skills and duct tape, right? Like, uh, I mean, that's that's really kind of kind of uh, kind of where we're good uh, from a plat from a platform airframe platform perspective. Um, we also have, you know, uh, the company that I work for, CAE, some of the best simulation and training in the world, right? For for fl flying flight, uh, and when you look at the ground. Um, you know, we do uh, in the London, uh, Ontario corridor, we do light and heavy armor uh, very, very well. Uh, so, you know, you would have seen in the headlines, the light armored vehicles. Um, they're, you know, they're going to the Ukraine, actually. They're, they're sought the world over, right? Uh, in fact, it's one of the few things that the United States buys from us as a platform. Um, so we make, we make those and we sell them, you know, the world over. And not to mention we're rebuilding in Canada our entire Navy. And I'm sure some of the, some of those ships are going to be, uh, you know, Arctic offshore patrol vessels and things like that are unique in all the world. So, so yeah. Um, and then when you look at the, the intangibles uh, and I'm, you know, you got me like super excited, uh, obviously, good, you, know, good. you know, there's like, we do, we have companies that provide uh, like artificial intelligence algorithms to NATO. Right. Uh, and, 
We have a specialty in the Waterloo Corridor in quantum computing, which is going to revolutionize uh, secure encryption. So, so it's it's here, like it's in Canada. It's just hard for us to to wrap our minds around exactly what it is, right? Yeah, especially when it's not the Avro Arrow, right? Like it's not the thing that that you could take a picture of. It's hard to take a picture of an AI algorithm and put it on the five dollar bill, for example, right? Exactly. But uh, but still, all all important and to be proud of for sure. Yeah, yeah. And Kristen, before we move along with some other questions we had, I did want to kind of go back to CADSD for a second because obviously we touched on CANSEC, which is you know has become the signature event and. And I guess, you know, for a lot of our listeners who may not be familiar, because I guess like from my own perspective, um, like I hadn't heard of, of CANSEC until this year, it just happened to be that our mechanical engineer that we have works that works for us here at Cambrian, he used to work for GDLS. And so ah. obviously, like he was familiar with CADS, he was familiar with CANSEC, and he said, we should go check it out this year, because I think there's a lot of the potential crossover opportunities to work with, you know, companies on the applied research side of things. But I, you know, without having Patrick here... I wouldn't have, this wouldn't have come on my radar, right? So I, I guess beyond what we now know about, you know, CANSEC, beyond that, um, and I know I talked about it in your bio in terms of like the, you, you know, you represent the business interests of over 650 companies across the country, but to the average person who hasn't heard of these two acronyms, um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about, you know, what CASD does and, and how it's important to our country? Yeah, sure. Uh, so de defense and security, um, you know, just from first principles, you they most people would hear it as like national defense or uh, public safety, right? So when you see, you know, the minister of public safety or minister of national defense, that that's kind of what we're talking about, right? At the at the federal level, um, and 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 those types of things, when you hit them at the the national sort of federal level, um, that you know is a part of ultimately how we keep Canadians safe, but also um, how we put ourselves out there in, in terms of the rest of the world. So it's a part of Canada's sort of foreign policy, which is every now and again, why you see global affairs minister as well, kind of, kind of, you know, uh, uh, dipping, dipping her toes in, in there. Um, we take the views of the, the business interests, our business community, and um, which are small Canadian businesses, small, medium, and large. Uh, and we, um, try to collectively uh, bring out those views. And sometimes it's very hard because they're, they're really different on the scale of what they, what they need and want. But we try to bring those views um, to the federal government uh, and you know, not, could be multiple or different or combinations of, of federal government departments, but really you know, defense and public safety kind of is, is where we, we land on those things. Um, and they uh, provide uh, stuff back, right? They, they are, we are like the glue between the business interests and the federal government as, as an association. So um, that's kind of what we do. We're, we're that conduit. Um, we, uh, we do engage because uh, of defense is a diplomatic thing, a po political thing. Uh, we do engage in diplomacy and I use that word loosely, but um, you know, in, around the world, the industrial part of defense is very tightly connected to its government, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think the best example of, of uh, a, a Canadian can see playing out on the world stage right now is, is the, the contributions that com countries are making to the Ukraine, right? So, so you see that, like, that is a language, it's a diplomatic activity, um, and, and we uh, participate with our industrial partners around the world uh, that are in these allied nations as well. So, you know, we have industrial uh, aspects to NATO. We uh, work with embassies and other countries. Uh, and right now, for example, to, to help equip the Ukraine, right? So that's the mm. sort of the uh, advocacy political side of it. Um, but we have this uh, big role because it's such a as, as you have a colleague from that used to work at GDLS, it's a tight knit tiny community where, you know, everyone is like one degree of someone else, right? Uh, either you, you served with them, either you work with them, you know, or, or, or you went to school with them. So, so we, we kind of glue that, try to glue that all together as a, it, it, in, in terms of being sort of, um, you know, these people that, that, that hold the community together, right? Um, and, and you, so you've been to trade shows and conferences probably all around the world. Uh, you were at CANSEC, 
you probably felt that the vibe was a little bit different, uh, maybe like with all the people uh, knowing all the other people. Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of like a, it's kind of, I like to describe it like it's a house party, but my, maybe minus like Frank the Tank, right? Uh, <laughs> um, <yeah>. Right? Uh, <laughs> That's a great um, reference. That's a right? huge reference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or from yeah. like my age, probably it's like Bluto in Animal House or something like that. But uh, same, same deal, right? Um, yeah. and, and so philosophically, uh, Cadsy's role is is to or, or encourage our community to sort of bring out the best in itself, right? Um, bring out the best. And coming back to those perceptions of industry, um, many of the people who gravitate towards this community, uh, you know, believe in a life of service because uh, a lot came out of uniform, right? We, we've worn that uniform. So uh, our my goal is always to inspire us to, to, to have our finest hours, right? Because when we're, we're making those contributions to what we see is creating to, to make a better Canada or to contribute to the greater good of the world, and and you know that that that's where we really shine, I think. Um, and you know some of the, the the companies that converted their manufacturing lines, the first movers during COVID were mm -hmm. were our members, right? It's that that that's the resonance uh, for, for for us. So our association, and that's probably a new bit since I came on, is you know I really feel quite strongly. It's it's my goal to inspire inspire our community to, to be there to, to be there and be, be their best in that kind of space. Yeah, and I, 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 I would have said too that I did feel that there was a like a community a collegial vibe at the conference. I mean, we've the, the, the main one that Steve and I typically go to every year is PDAC, which is the mining, you know, it's the Prospectors Developers Association of Canada. And that's a big conference too. But I think because it's so big, you probably have those pockets of community, but I think walking the floor at Cansec, like you, you definitely could pick up on it. Um, you know, as you kind of saw people bump into each other and everyone kind of had this, you know, so, I mean, maybe over years, like that, that certainly develops, but I definitely could see that interconnectedness. And I mean, I would say that I know that we didn't have Frank, the tank at Cansec, but you did have, you did have a robot. We went to the lock, one of the receptions that was put on by Lockheed Martin. And there was a pretty big robot that was walking around with, uh, with, I believe, uh, like CO2 cannons or, or something yeah, like yeah, yeah, it, it was, yeah, yeah it was, it was oh, pretty yeah. good though. So, I mean, no Frank the tank, but still, I think you guys did pretty well. Um, you know, one of the other questions I want to ask, you I know, we already kind of touched on this in terms of peacekeeping and how, you know, now we refer to it as peace operations, but Steve and I are, are students of history. So for us, like studying Canadian history, Canada's always, you know, had this perception globally and, and internally as a peacekeeping nation going all the way back to the Suez crisis and then through operations in the eighties and nineties. But, yeah. you know, obviously things have changed a lot since then. How do you how do you feel that or how do you think that Canada is viewed on the global stage? Do we still have that vestige of a peacekeeping nation or has that kind of has has that kind of gone the wayside over the last couple of decades? Or is that still part of the identity that you you think is um, is kind of put on the way that uh, the global stage perceives Canada and the defense and securities industries within our country? Um, so peacekeeping, I think, is part of Canada's identity, 100%, right? Blue Berets, I mean, we, we all know, know what that is. Um, it's deeply, it's so deeply ingrained in, in, in Canadians. Uh, you know, it, it runs as deep as how we like to be told by other countries that we're super nice, polite people and that we say A all the time, right? Like, I mean, that's how deep uh, peacekeeping is for us. Um, and like I mentioned, there's not a lot of peace to keep nowadays, right? Uh, we call it peace operations and and what peace operations really is 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 enforcing and that's a particular word and enforcing the peace right enforcing the rule of law which means really that it equals conflict um now the good news is that our military might be small and our budgets uh the, its budget's tight but it's it's highly effective and and very well respected in the world um when i go overseas on behalf of cadsi um I run into politicians and, and militaries from other countries, and they can't um, say enough about how uh, well trained and 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 switched on our our men and women in uniform are, um, and the, and how grateful they are for for like Canada's contributions on the world stage. So so that is, I mean, I think we've 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 managed to to keep that. Um, whether it's a peacekeeping identity or just a, we're, we're the solids in the whole thing, right? Um, that's still there. Uh, now for the downside, um, I think we're viewed uh, as being able to give a lot more. Um, and I'm not talking about the raging debate you would have probably seen in the headlines about uh, NATO's 2% of GDP. Um, 
I'm talking about our ability to contribute in, in general and mm-hmm. uh, our rather sort of passive, lackadaisical, um, you've heard the Americans refer to it as the free riding approach that we have in this country. And, and we know why, right? Ca- Canadians largely generally feel safe every day. Um, the U.S. superpower, you know, is our neighbor to the south. Uh, and defense doesn't drive votes for any government, right? So, so you look at all that, and and that that it kind of contributes to this us being sort of the the underachievers, I guess, if you you will. Um, that being said, we're stretched pretty thin in terms of our military doing uh, the home game as well as the away game, and not being a, a huge you know a huge military uh, superpower, right? So. Um, so yeah, that, like I said, we still have a really great reputation in the world. Um, but you know, I think people are, are cottoning on a little bit to our to our game of wait and see, right? It, yeah, that those are excellent insights, and thank you for that. Um, just uh, to be selfish for a moment, uh, Mike and I obviously work at a research institution uh, within a Canadian educational institute. Um, Beyond the work of training the fine officers that serve in the military uh, in the future, so beyond RMC, uh, what other post-secondary institutions across the country do you think are contributing in a meaningful way uh, to the defense and securities industry uh, that you could think of that would be uh, worth mentioning? Yeah, no, uh, like uh, you guys, uh, you're late to the party. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. It is true. I'm sorry. You are late to the party. Uh, um, so, you know, first, the industry does roughly, um, uh, I think it's, a, oh my gosh, uh, four, two, somewhere between 200 and 400 million yeah, each year self-funded of, of research and development. Uh, and that can be, uh, it's not so much, you know, we're not looking at vaccines, but uh, mainly applied research and development, although we do look at critical minerals, elements, and, and, and other things like that, especially when you're getting into uh, the semiconductors and uh, and and um, components, um, but there are over forty five. So I hesitate to list them, but over forty five academic and research institutions that are directly engaged with uh, defense companies um, doing work for us on our programs. Right. So uh, we 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 need to build ships for the for the Canadian Navy, and uh, you know there are a host of 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 academics, uh, research fellows and, and universities that some of them have chairs that are looking into anything like, you know, from oceanography to um, to ships, hulls and, and crit- the critical minerals that go into that, right? Um, so, so yeah, it, like it's massive. And most defense firms, like I, I was telling you guys, um, because we do the commercial side as well, uh, we're heavily involved in in the supercluster initiative in, in this country. Yeah. Um, so you know, ocean sciences, artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, and digital technology. I think the only one that we're not we're not doing something of. And I bet if I cracked that open, I'd find some crazy shit coming out of our members. And is is the protein supercluster right? <laughs> like I, I wouldn't be surprised if we found somebody doing some research on like uh, ration packs for the Canadian Armed Forces in the protein. Uh, in the protein industry. So, so yeah, um, uh, you know, tons, everything from London Fanshawe to, to Waterloo to, um, to to the guys supporting the aerospace cluster in Montreal to, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dow and, and uh, God, I mean, I could, you are really late to the party. Like that's all I can say. Yeah. Well, better, better late than never. Right. So we are starting to, from the, uh, the good work we did at CanSec, we are starting to engage in a really meaningful way with a lot of the companies there, particularly on the vehicle side. So we're, we're really yeah. excited about that. Right. So, so yeah, it, it was, it was probably a surprise to you, to, to you right? Like that you they like had a play there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's, I mean, that's kind of why, uh, like why we initially went was because of Patrick's previous experience at GDLS. Like we thought this is a unique you know, perspective that we have at Cambrian where, it's a it's an untapped sector for us because we haven't explored that before. But given Patrick's experience at GD, we figured that's a good bridge for us. But I think after Pat and I went there and we saw how some of the vehicle technologies have applicability in the mining industry when it comes to exploring remote areas or getting to, you know, 
using um, autonomous vehicles and battery powered vehicles like this all kind of fits with where mining is going and the tech that we're now seeing in mining. So I think what CanSec did for us is open our eyes to what we thought was the bridge through Patrick. You know, there's a bigger bridge through the technology that we're now seeing being adopted in mining. Right. So, again, we're definitely late, uh, but we hope that we can make up some time, uh, you know, in the coming months and years now. So, yes, you're heavily engaged in the party. You're, you brought the beer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah, in, yeah, we're in, we'll, we'll be coming back for sure. Um, but, you know, before we let you go, I mean, you've been really generous with your time. You know, we did want to ask you this because it, it was in your bio and, you know, we'd mentioned mining. That's an industry that we serve a lot here at, at Cambrian and in, in Sudbury, Ontario, obviously. Uh, but much like mining, the defense and security sector is, is male dominated. And obviously you'd mentioned how in, in 2014, you know, you became the first woman to lead CADSD. Can you talk a bit about how you've blazed a trail for women in this space, not only in your time at CADSI, but throughout your career? Because again, um, I'm sure you've encountered that uh, at your time at CAE and then before you got to CADSI, it's still, it's still obviously a, an ongoing uh, challenge that we hope to kind of break down those barriers in the future. Yeah, I mean, it feels totally weird to call it blazing a trail. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. I been in the sector forever so it doesn't really you know it's just it's just my job right like it's the thing that I that I like um uh so just for everyone you know to give them a, a bit of a background I think women make up about only about 25 percent of uh, of employees in the sector and and the bit tougher bit is that um they tend even in that space they tend towards the more traditional types of roles within companies like human resources or communications or, or, or uh, office administration, right? Uh, women in STEM, uh, even though you've just heard us talk about all that juicy STEM stuff that we're doing, uh, women in STEM is still a challenge in not only in our industry, but in the country, right? And, and, and that's not been helped uh, with the pandemic the talent shortage and uh, still household burdens that are the w women traditionally take on, you know, we largely shoulder the household burden uh, um, pandemic or otherwise. Right. So, uh, so I, I, I like, uh, let me see, probably the best story is I was hosting uh, Francis Allen, uh, Lieutenant General Francis Allen at, at, at Kansik. Uh, she's the vice chief of defense staff. And, uh, we were being piped in by a female piper uh and and i i was like i'm so excited this is an all-female procession <laughs> and uh and and i told her you know i said like i'm a huge believer in you can't be what you can't see um and i, I suppose uh it, it, for me it just like that's the nut right um and i i think Every individual business leader doesn't just have to put in place, you know, their policies and 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 um, uh, structures to make it happen in their in their companies or in their entities, right? Their organizations. They have to do the things that make it so in practice, um, because you know, no affirmative action or quotas or. or uh, you know, a gender parity, pay equity scales is going to organically change the face and the role of women in especially high technology sectors and, and in my sector defense or in, in your case in, in mining or, or even in academia, which I think is probably a little bit more a better shaped right um, and, and it's small things. So it, it's removing impediments for, for women or, or, or anyone for that matter in in the workforce, and and I'm not kidding when I say it's small things. So perfect example, uh, Monique gave you a call this morning to try and figure out like, uh, you know, was this going to be on video or is this just a voice? And and you know, I'm a woman. I waste a shit ton of time, uh, you know, between a half hour and an hour every day, uh, you know, trying to manage my eyebrows and my curly Gina hair, right? Like, yeah, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> And if I don't have to do that, um, and 60% and of my staff are women, if we don't have to do that, uh, we get that time back, whether it's for, for work or for our families or whatever, it's reclaimed, uh, reclaimed time. So if we turn off our cameras, uh, we, you know, we get that time back. And it sounds like such a weird thing. Just, you know, trust your people, turn off the damn cameras, uh, yeah. but you need to be sort of switched on and it's, it's tiny, right? And then if you think that small, it's really easy to think about the bigger stuff, right? If I want the women in my company to be 
successful and make it to the C-suite one day, whether that's my job or, or, or somewhere else. Um, I need to teach them how to run a profit and loss center, right? A P&L. And I need to teach them what corporate finance means because the single biggest impediment to women uh, getting in major leadership and executive roles is, is things like corporate finance, right? So it all starts from just, I, I'd argue, like the littlest, littlest things. And, uh, and about, you know, I don't know, just having leaders, which is just our amazing people to their employees, full stop, you know, men and women create an environment where uh, employees can see who you are. Uh, you know, we're slightly flawed people. You can see that, you know, you can turn to me. I'll listen to you. I'll react. I'll be transparent. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, let you challenge my ideas. I'm not insecure. I'll show you my insecurities and the rationale for my decisions. Uh, I love telling people like I'm, I, I like to be recklessly transparent and I think we need a lot of people, more people in leadership that way. And if we do that with any employee, I think the women, women will rise to the top, just like the men do. Right. That's awesome. What a way to end now as a parting shot. Um, perhaps what I'll do is have a little bit of fun. Uh, we did learn that you uh, are a lover of craft beer and I should say I am too, so much so that uh, like an idiot, I've uh, purchased a steak in a small craft brewery in Ontario. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really small, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But um, if you could kindly share with us and the listeners, um, I would say favorite craft beer, but that, that doesn't make sense. But like, w- what are some favorites for you about craft beer? Uh, well, okay. So first, not fair because they're like I have no favorites. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mike, were you there around the end of Cansac where we rolled out the beer carts? Uh, I, I definitely had beer on the floor for sure, yeah. but I think that was at that, that uh, oh, specific company booth. So yeah, no, I, I don't. I, I must have missed that. So now I know I definitely have to go back. So <laughs> exactly right, late to the party and then miss the Pies de Rezi stops. <laughs> I mean, you 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 know. Um, yeah, at the end of Kansas, we roll out uh, beer carts. And because it's like, <laughs> I, 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 if I'm going to be in charge of this damn thing, we're going to have uh, have some beer at the end of it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, like, you can ask me what, what beer I like. So right now, you know, it's summertime. I'm drinking uh, White Waters Blood Moon Sour. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and my, in my fridge is uh, uh, Blood Brothers uh, Smoke and Tears uh, Mango Heat. And uh, a, a leftover from last year uh, called Tenafly Viper, um, and I've been rationing that that off. Um, I, I and I I think I still got another uh, Collective Arts um, smoothie sour as well. And Those are good. That's, yeah, they're really good. And 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 you know when you read the label, it sounds like totally disgusting, right? Like <laughs> strawberries, granola, and and I blended up my breakfast and I, I made a beer out of <laughs> super. Um, uh, and, and although it sounds like I'm all about the sours, there's a, a good um, whippersnapper uh, um, cream ale called Okela. It's coriander ginger. And oh. if you pair that with like some uh, curry mussels in the summertime, uh, it is like divine, like divine. I know. Now, I, now you're I, talking. Now you're I talking. Know, right? yeah. um, and, and then and then in the fall and winter, I, I'm a stout and porter, uh, porter lady. So uh, Whitewater makes um, Jack Frost demise. Have you ever had that? It's a, yep. it's a hint of a hint of peppermint on that. And my go-to to standby is uh, Judas Ciel's Peche Mortel uh, because it's like high test at nine point five percent. And I'm a socially anxious person, so if I down one of those before a networking function, I don't have to hide in the bathroom for about twenty minutes. Um, <laughs> so yeah. And uh, and there's a Beyond the Pales uh, uh, dark and picante as well. So uh, I bet you're sorry that you asked or, or you're thirsty. Oh my God. No. I mean, I, I, when someone tells me someone's a fan of craft beer, you know, I take that as like, okay, well that's, that's interesting, but you're, you're into it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and food, like, uh, like don't, you know, it doesn't end with a beer. It's like food, wine, spirits, and, 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 uh, eating and drinking, I suppose is, is high on my list of things to do, uh, when yeah. I'm not working. So, yeah. 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 That's What's awesome. your favorite? What, like, uh, give me, do you have one? You know? oh, well, I, th- well, I think, uh, like one of the ones we make at uh, my, the brewing, uh, the brewery is called Burwash Brewing. It's an old prison camp uh, cool. outside of Sudbury. Uh, that's what the name's based off of my, myself and a couple of the other founders. Uh, their parents grew up there and their our grandparents were jail guards. Uh, they were all World War II vets that then went to work at this jail outside of Sudbury. 
Um, but uh, one of the ones we have is a Belgian triple uh, yet to be named. That's actually 11% oh. that, go that goes down way, way, way too, uh, too smooth. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, uh, a one that we're calling like a rye red. So it has yeah. a, a good rye taste to it. I think Mike's had that before. I have, but and, Steve uh, doesn't bring enough of them into work to give yeah, us for the true. weekend. So yeah, maybe now true. that we're saying it over the airwaves that he'll, he'll smarten up and start bringing in more for us to sample, especially that... <laughs> That 11% sounds dangerous, but I'd be willing to, I'd be willing to test it out for you, Steve. Yeah, it is dangerous. <laughs> well, that yeah. Tenafly Viper is 11.1%. And wow. uh, I tell you, like, uh, I have over, I've got a, a, a buddy that I like to, we do a Zoom beer thingamabob and, and like one of those, and I'm sort of like, hey, I'm a little bit smashed, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, yeah. and I've already eaten like, uh, so yeah, those things can pack a wall up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you gotta watch yourself. But anyway, I could talk about beer forever. Uh, you've generously gone over time with us. Uh, so thank you so much for doing this. It was uh, fantastic to talk to you and a lot of fun. So uh, we thank you. And maybe we'll see you at Kanzec next year. Oh, I hope so. You should, uh, yeah, uh, please, please come. Awesome. It'll be a, yeah. Thanks, Kristen. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks so for much. having me. Thanks. You came for the Kansec and the CADSD, but you stayed for the beer. Um, that was a great conversation, Steve. I think one of the other things that, you know, that really resonated with me was when she used the term recklessly transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and that probably hits home for me because I feel like that's probably part of my leadership style is that I've always believed that in order to, I think, effectively lead people and have people want to be led by you, you have to be transparent. And sometimes I'm admittedly maybe too transparent in how I feel and what I think. But I think that that's part of building that trust in, your, in the relationship you have with your people, that if you don't have that, um, you can have a title as a leader, but you won't actually be able to lead people. And I could tell just by having that, you know, that 45 minute chat with her, that that's definitely how she, you know, leads her organization. And I'm sure that's, that's how she's built, built a trust with her, with not only the people that she works with at CADSI, but I think with the member organizations that are, that make up the umbrella of the companies that she represents. Yeah. I think that was a, a hugely influential thing she was talking about uh, in lieu of the question you had asked her. The other thing that was sort of meaningful for me is how, uh, you know, the Canadian perception is uh, that whole discussion we had about Canadian perceptions uh, in other countries from a military perspective. And it just brings me back to a thing my dad used to tell me. My dad served in the uh, early 70s uh, as a mechanic in the Canadian Armed Forces. And he would always say something that I'm paraphrasing now because he's a Frenchman. Uh, but he would say, you know, we had uh, we had no budget and even less resources. Right. So <laughs> you're trying to keep a fleet of, you know, tanks or personnel carriers uh rolling and uh, and you have nothing but you do it and he always said that he was a better mechanic for it uh because you know you're trying to do a lot with uh, with a little mm -hmm. and then when you go to other organizations after that you know you're a very well-rounded uh, mechanic you can weld uh you can do all kinds of things uh, that you couldn't strictly do if you were just a mechanic somewhere else with more resources so uh, that resonated with me as well yeah, no. And again, I think uh, I, I take her criticism that we are late to the party, uh, yeah. but certainly I think there's a lot of crossover applicability with the technologies that we're seeing now in mining and some of the other heavy industries. And again, I think that's part of one of, we, we didn't really talk about it, but I think it was kind of in a, it was part of the conversation that you and I as students of history know that a lot of the innovations that we see that become the household products and things that we have in our, our day to day, whether it's in healthcare or it's how we get to work or how we get to conference to conference that originate a lot of that originated in that sector. Um, and then obviously has the, the, the applicability beyond that, right. For its original mm -hmm. purpose. And I think that's kind of interesting now to see where we're going, especially with BEVs and autonomous vehicles. Like, you know, a lot of that cutting edge work is happening in the defense and securities industries. And certainly I think when it comes to cybersecurity, which we didn't even really talk about, but that's another huge thing that we're seeing more and more of that. You know, Cambrian's rolling out a cybersecurity program in that's the right. fall. Um, I couldn't help but think when I was rolling around, or not rolling around, roving around. <laughs> I'm just thinking of that <laughs> beer cart now, rolling around yeah, on the yeah. floor. I can't yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris didn't yeah. tell the audience I'm not allowed back. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but there's all sorts of other applicabilities there when it comes to cybersecurity that, you know, now more and more organizations like Cambrian and, and the graduates that were graduating that are going to go to work in those securities industries. Like that's, that's a whole other thing that maybe if we have her back, we can talk about that as well. But again, a really great conversation. Uh, and I'm glad we had her on. Yeah. I guess the only thing left to do is this Mike, what craft beer are you drinking right now? 
putting well, it actually, on the spot. So here, I'll, I'll share this funny story and then we'll, we'll cut it off. I have um, one too. I have one too. Okay. So I was in Huntsville recently. I guess not, I don't want to say recently because we don't know when this is going to air, but I was in Huntsville right. at some point in the summer and we went to Lake of Bays and they sure. had a deal on, it was like a case of beer, a case of tall cans was going for, I want to say it was $48 each, which is a pretty good deal for a two, four of tall cans. Right. So I was with my father-in-law who's like, well, we got to, we have to buy these then <laughs> like and there, was, <laughs> there was four cases. I'm like, well, I don't really like that. Like, this is not really my jam, but like, I would take a case of that he's like, well, what if we just bought all four and we just split them? So I'm now leaving my lunch with a $96 like tab for this two cases of beer <laughs> that I had no intention of buying. Um, but, but so of those beers, the one I'm drinking right now is Lake of Bays. It's a, it's a wild berry sour. Nice. It's 4%. Uh, it's, it's great. Like on a hot day, which it's been unseasonably hot. Uh, thanks climate change. And uh, so I've been drinking those and those are great. But I think the one thing I'd want to say before I let you say what your favorite beer is, is that many years ago, my father-in-law was one of those, like, he was like a, like a Labatt Blue, like Molson X type of beer drinker. And then I was starting to get into craft beers and I'm like, you should get Flying Monkeys. And which is a brewery in, in Barrie, I believe is where it started. Mm -hmm. And so he went to a, an NHL like playoff draft one year. He bought a six pack of Flying Monkeys probably didn't realize that he bought like a, the eight to 10% that they were offering. And you know, <laughs> needless to say, his night did not go well after he had those. So he was like, I think he swore off craft beer at that point, but now he's like, he's back in, he's back in, he's trying all sorts of different craft beers. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how I got roped into those two cases, but now, um, you know, that, uh, that Lake of Bays, uh, wild berry sour has been a pretty good one for me. Yeah, I think, um, and that's it's actually good because I think our generation is actually influencing the uh, the beer tastes of uh, of our uh, of our predecessors. Yeah, my um, I, I would say my dad too. He's he's still pretty firm with with the beers that he drinks, but yeah, uh, I'd see I'm seeing more and more craft beers in the fridge. I think they're probably more for me, but uh, he's become <laughs> more adventurous, so I got to give yeah. credit for that too. Okay, well, what we'll go out on is I've actually I have a six pack uh, from Grove Brewing Company. Uh, in Leamington. Sorry, I believe it's in Kingsville, right next to Leamington. But just to tie it back to where uh, Kristen is from, it's a brewery that opened, I think, a couple of years ago. And I right now I'm drinking a peach sour uh, that, that they make. And it's actually real good. It's around four and a half percent, too. And uh, it's, again, great on a hot day. I don't know if our listeners can hear it, but there's actually some thunder outside right now. So maybe we'll get off before it cuts. Yeah, so this is uh, this has been the unlikely uh, beer drinkers podcast, and so yeah. we'll be back. Maybe we'll be back with another beer review next week, or what we're on to next. But again, thanks for tuning in, and thanks to our guest uh, Kristen Sanfrani for joining us today. It's been great chatting with her. Bye bye. The unlikely innovators with Mike Comito and Steve Gravel, presented by Cambrian R and D in the Center for Smart Mining.